for all to feed off of, then Romans chapter 8 is one of the grandest platters that is on that table. Romans 8 is impregnated with so many truths. Romans 8 is that chapter which Paul, through the Spirit, encourages us all that a life in Christ is no longer a life under condemnation. That a life in Christ means that we are inheritors of the blessed blessings of God. That we are heirs of God. We are adopted into His family and that we dare not to feel as those who we need to live in fear, but we are people who can cry, Abba, Father. And most importantly, we are called to suffer that Romans 8 speaks of, but he encourages us in verse 18 that though we suffer, none of the sufferings in this world is worth the weight of glory that we will experience in heaven. He speaks of a groaning of creatures, he speaks of our internal groaning, and then he speaks of the Spirit's groaning. And finally, he comes to this last portion of this grand platter of Romans chapter 8, and he speaks of this ultimate encouragement that all things work out good according to God's purpose for those who love him. And so tonight, we continue our study of his sovereignty, which this is the same text we used last Lord's Day evening to discuss God's sovereignty and liberty to even bend and allow the inclinations of man's heart to fit and align up with his sovereign decree from eternity past. How he who fashioned the heart, like David who said that the king's heart is in the hands of God and he directs it in the way that it goes like river, like a water and the river. And so we see that all over scripture. And I think it was wise for us to study in that way because we would not understand the, the very promise of Romans 8.28 until we come to acknowledge God's sovereignty for the recipient. And now that we have already set up in our minds and established who these recipients are, these, of course, are the ones who are called according to God's purpose. And so now we will also see the sovereignty of God in all things for all of God's children. This is why all theologians of the past, almost all of them, at least the good ones, would tell you, that the sovereignty of God is absolutely comforting. Spurgeon was the one that we've quoted twice now who said that uh, in all of our afflictions and all our distresses, the sovereignty of God silences us and allows us to consider that he is worthy to be worshiped rather than one to receive our mockery or complaints. And so all things work together for good. And so what exactly does that mean, right? But we first need to be reminded that if all things work out good, that there is one who allows or is the one who has destined all these things to work out good for those ordained recipients. Of course, this is God who has established his throne in the heavens, who has dominion over all things, according to Psalm 103. And we have learned already that scripture testifies of this sovereignty displayed first off with creation, the creation of God in all things, and then the fall of man we saw and then we again studied regarding his sovereignty seen in the call of man, his effective call, his efficacious call in the drawing of men to Christ. And so we saw that liberty of God for the sake of his holy name. And we return now to understand all things. It was the 17th century Puritan Thomas Watson, one of my most favorite Puritans of all time, who shook my heart to understand God's sovereignty in this way, as my mind is so limited, so finite, that my thoughts of God's sovereignty is merely an image of God on his throne. But how does that translate itself to all of those who believe? How does that translate itself in time to those he had created? And Thomas Watson wrote such a wonderful piece on this one text and described Romans 8.28 to be a glorious privilege. He said that the text cries out the certainty of the privilege and the excellency of the privilege. We may change the wording today in our modern um, uh, language. Instead of a glorious privilege, a glorious right or a glorious promise. And so Watson speaks of Romans 8.28 to be a glorious promise. There is a certainty in this promise and there is an excellency stated in this text alone for those, of course, called by God. And the certainty specifically found in the words, we know. Paul uses the words, we know, which expresses again the assurance of the promise that is being delivered to us or expressed to the people who would hear this very word of God. Not we hope or we think, but we know, like our creeds that are ratified 
and they are there set in stone and cannot be changed. Like the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone. When God speaks his word, we know it is assured for in the lives of every believer. He then pleads with his reader to not rest in skepticism or doubts, uh, as Watson would uh, uh, suggest and encourage his people to never doubt God, to never be a skeptic of God, but to labor, he says, to come to a certainty in the things of religion, to never worry, to never be confused or obscure our minds of the things that we see or feel or experience, but that we would have a long life journey in seeking for the things of God. And then he states that the excellency of this privilege is expressed in the words, all things work together for good. That is the assurance that we know. And the excellency is all things work together. We are already being told by the apostle of God, by the Holy Spirit that inspired man to give that promise to you. Watson said that it is a sovereign medicine all God's providences are divinely tempered and sanctified and work together for the best of the saints. He who loves God and is called according to his purpose may be rest assured that everything in the world shall be for his good. Why should the Christian destroy himself? And he's in reference, he's, sorry, he's referring to our doubts and depressions that we experience. Why should we destroy ourselves internally? Why should he kill himself with care? when all things shall sweetly concur, yea, conspire for his good. When you begin to experience stress and worry and unsettled, and where your peace that rests in the promises of God are rattled because of what is happening in your life, the present, it is easy for us to talk about being assured of and, and, and to have certainty and a peace while there's no storm. But as the storm comes, we then are tested whether we will hold on to those promises of God. But as we come and expect that those things will come our way because it is the testing of God for our better character and our further sanctification, we must find refuge in the promise that God is sovereign and that he ensures that all things will work out good for those he has called. If you are one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and have come to acknowledge his beauty and his glory, then this promise is for you. All things, he says, all things are for you. After all, it is the psalmist who wrote, as we have just read in Psalm 25, verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. He will never lead his children astray. He will never set us on a path to destruction. He will always, as he is faithful, lead us into a path where we re realize his love and where his faithfulness is realized. Of course, Verse 10 says, for those who keep his covenant and testimony. And so today we will consider uh, in the pot of all things, first, the best things. Because it's hard for Pastor John to talk about all things in one sermon. Uh, and even when I do divide this in two, we're never going to be able to talk about all things. But we must consider the best things are meant for the good of all the elect or the saints of God called by his name. Considering that we are doing a series in the attributes of God, I think the first thing that we must accept is the obvious truth that is fresh in our minds that all of his attributes work for our good. I mean, every single attribute that we've talked about so far has a comforting um, aspect, a comforting uh, intent within them. All of it is meant for our good. From his glorious power, which softens our hearts, Job 23, 16, which strengthens us, according to Colossians 1.11, by that divine power of God, which treads our iniquities underfoot, Micah 7.19, which conquers our enemies, which breaks the rod or breaks our enemies with the rod of iron, Psalm 2.9. And this power provides us a dwelling place, a refuge within the everlasting arms of God, Deuteronomy 33.27. From our hearts, to our strength against our enemies, in overcoming our enemies, to providing us a shelter and a comfort in the midst of our afflictions within the everlasting arms of God, the power of God is for our good. To his wisdom, which positions himself as our ultimate counselor in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, 
He is mighty God, but indeed counselor, fitting to be counselor above all counselors, for he is the one who is infinite in wisdom, who we are able to most comfortably come to, as scripture says, to boldly approach his throne of grace and ask and seek of him. And he who is our ultimate counselor, as we read again in Psalm 25, he is the one who instructs his people in his grace, in his mercy. He is our ultimate counselor. For we are often in the dark when we are in situations so complex, but God always comes with his wisdom of light. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Isn't that a glorious truth? That your God will counsel you, that your God will instruct you, he will direct you in the way you should go, and he says, I will counsel you with my eye. And that's in reference, of course, to his wisdom. That's in reference to his wisdom of light that shines in our situations of com uh, difficulty, our situations of trial. And so his wisdom ultimately works for our good. To his goodness, which is never withheld from those who walk uprightly. Psalm 84, 11, It is never upheld or withheld, sorry, from us. His goodness, which is meant to lead us to repentance. Romans 2, 4 which is demonstrated in Christ's death, Romans 5, 7, and 8, which works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure, Philippians 2, 13, which you can really say that God's goodness is meant to make us good. And so, in that case, it certainly is for our good. And lastly, his goodness is created, or we are created by his goodness in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2, 10. And of course, the list is endless, I do not desire to go through every single attribute with you, for then we wouldn't need to meet here every evening. But the list is endless. We can look at all the attributes of God revealed in Scripture and be rest assured that all of them are meant for our ultimate good. And since we are here in Romans 8, why don't we read verse 31 to see how the Lord in all of his attributes intends to make this happen, giving us our destiny. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, and that's why I brought us here, being that his attributes are for us, God, his person is for us, who can be against us? Again, in acknowledgement of his sovereignty, who can thwart his will? Who is there like him? There is no other God like him. Verse 32, to he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate, separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because God is, has placed us on his side. All that is in God's power will work out good for those he has called unto himself. Verse 35 is where we find ourselves contemplating of his sovereignty, many times doubting it, when we find ourselves in tribulation, distress, persecution, all the way to the worst extreme being death. But the sovereignty of God is seen in all of them. From our poverty to our physical ailments to our own very death, we will all realize his sovereignty. And secondly, not only that the attributes of God work out good for us, but because of God's perfect nature, the certainty of every promise for our good is spoken of in Scripture. Not just His attributes, but all of God's promises are for your good. I understand that each promise has its own individual and unique context to a people that it was given to. But more so, ultimately described in Scripture, that this God who is yes and amen, who will fulfill all good things for His elect, if he had done it in the past, he will certainly do it. And many 
of, uh, of scholars have said, uh, at least covenant scholars who have said that when we look back to the Old Testament retrospectively, we are not to dismiss them and say this is a good historical fact that God had done, an event that he had done. Truly it is. But we must always comfort our soul that this God may not exactly do what he he had done for those people of the past, but he certainly intends that we read that for our own soul's encouragement of what he will promise to fulfill in our future. And so, secondly, the promises of God are for our good, whether they be direct or indirect promises, if you are curious of those things, for there are words in Scripture that may not be exactly a direct promise, but they are indirect promises, such as what we read in Psalm 25, how the Lord actively is giving instruction and guidance to all that He has called. And so in a world full of distractions, doubts, and fears, we often forget that God has given us promises. We can name a few, but we don't consider the depth of those in our soul, meaning we don't really have been, we haven't really been moved by them, or we do not allow the Spirit by them to move our hearts. It's one thing to have them in our minds that God did this and said He would do it, but does it move our soul? Does it comfort our soul? That in this life of sin and corruption, that He has made all these great and glorious promises. How do we know that we shouldn't forsake them? Because the Apostle Peter himself was the one who said in 2 Peter 1.4 uh, that the veil of our eyes may be uh, taken away for these are precious and very great promises. So if they are precious, they are very great and he's referring to the Old Testament promises and then now in Christ Jesus, then we too then should embrace these very precious and very great promises promises. And so even when we remember them, we again hesitate as that is our fleshly bend to directly apply them to ourselves. But he who called you unto himself had no need to make an oath, and that's one thing to consider. God never needed to make an oath, but for the sake of your security, for the sake of your ultimate good, your peace and your courage, God made many oaths. Think about that. And we would be unwise to neglect them and dismiss them as we read Scripture. For example, when we find ourselves in guilt, there is a promise. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, for giving iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus 34, verse 6. Before your conversion, in your sinful state and dead state, and for all who are called to come, there is a promise. Think about that. Before we came to Christ in our wickedness, there was a promise spoken. And yet there is this promise still awaiting to be fulfilled for those who are yet to come into the fold of God. The word of God says, I will heal their apostasy. You see, a people who did not seek him, a people who did not know him, have been, a promise had been uttered long, long ago for their sake. Yet they will only come to realize it when God awakens their soul from the dead. And so before their conversion, Hosea 14.4, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will put my law within them, Jeremiah 31.33. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, for they shall all know me. For I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin no more. In our dead state, when there was no hope, he sought after those who did not seek him. That's you and I. And that was a promise uttered long ago, and now we've come to realize it in Christ. Praise God for that. When we find ourselves in trouble, brethren, for our good, there is a promise. Psalm 91, 15 to 16. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him. In trouble, I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The days of your trouble, you call, he will answer. That's uttered many times in all the Old Testament and in the very lips, from the very lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the, psalm, the great psalm says he hears us from afar or he knows our thoughts from afar. Another example is when we are threatened by self-pity. 
regarding earthly wants, whenever we feel uh, that we are uh, in a poverty state or a state where we long for things and there's nothing that we, uh, that we need that is in our hands. Again, self-pity regarding our lack. There's a promise even for that. Psalm 34.10, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing because all things are given to them. Praise the Lord. Next, when you fall into doubt regarding your livelihood, how am I going to provide food for the, uh, on the table, pay for the rent, survive each day in the, diffi- in the difficulties of this life? And I know I've spoken to some of you already. Pastor, the groceries are going higher and higher. The wages are going lower and lower. Fast food is just cheap. Um, <laughs> it used to be cheap, but more expensive. And when you do eat them, it's, it's preparing you for a heart attack. This world is cruel, right? The system is against you. I've heard it all. But there's a promise even for you, saint of God, in a world such as this. Psalm 37, 25, 26, I have been young and now am old, yet have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously. Believe that. And his children become a blessing. They are not a people to be looked down upon, but they are a people exalted for his name's sake to show that he is a faithful God. And so this faithful God in whom we serve is faithful to keep his promises. Therefore, we come to the conclusion that all of his promises from all books of, in all of the scripture is for you. And I pray that you see all of these promises work for good because for what reason? Why do we say that these promises work for good? Is it because we can just memorize a promise and keep it in the back of our minds? No, because each promise is meant to increase our faith. It's meant to increase our strength, and that's why it's for our good. Every time we hear it, it reminds us of God's faithfulness, and it increases our trust in the Lord, and absolutely it is for our good. And so we have his attributes, we have all of his promises, and thirdly, all the means of grace works for your good. We can talk about those private means of grace from the times that the Lord has granted you prayer, the time the Lord has brought you into his word, where you and your husband and, or wife are able to gather and read God's word. Those are means of grace. Where the Spirit reminds you of the scripture in the time of your difficulty, those are means of grace. And Watson said that the saints' graces are weapons to defend them, wings to elevate them, jewels to enrich them, spices to perfume them, stars to adorn them, and cordials to refresh them. And so when we, you know, despise the means of grace, we despise the work of God in, for our good. Whether they be private or public, these means of grace include every single thing that is meant for your Christian sanctification, your growth in the Lord. And including these means of grace is every word preached to you from the word of God, whether it be under the sound of your preacher's voice or whether you are hearing God's word on the television or on a podcast or reading it on your private, in your private time. All of God's word is for your good. For each word of grace is soul penetrating, soul transforming. And the word of God is a two-edged sword piercing into the very soul of man. Oftentimes people do not want to be under the sound of God's voice. And I mean God's word, that is. It's because it penetrates the soul. But the sheep love hearing his voice. The sheep hunger for, uh, for these things. They thirst to drink of this living water found in his word. And so it is for our good because each word of grace is meant to conform us further and further into Christ's likeness producing a faith grounded in hope. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power. It's one of the texts that I hope that I use this morning. But it really is a text for us to hear. Have we received the word of God in word only? Or have we received them in power? Martin Lloyd-Jones says, uh, the word of God uh, is, uh, sorry, I posted it. We should, in our approach to the word of God, should not come as experts. 
but those willing to come under its power as humble people. And so we've received it. But have we received it in word only? No, we've received it in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Every time we're under the means of His grace, the word of His grace, and under its preaching directly to our soul individually, He is conforming us further into Christ's likeness that we would increase in hope. Whether you know it or not, even by just listening to these words with an open heart, with an open mind, the Lord is increasing the capacity of your faith. The very... Uh, hope that you have in him the means of grace also include every prayer raised to the throne of god do you realize how important prayer is do you realize that you had no access to prayer before you had no access to the throne of grace before christ changed your life before he saved you you know means of knowing god you were atheist you were idolaters you were a people who spoke to the wind but he has given you life and he has saved you granting you access to that throne of grace and no matter where you are no matter what uh, you find yourself in he is considering your prayers every prayer raised to the throne of god is for your good spurgeon said prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence power of god works and the prayer of God's people is intended for that attribute of power to move on your behalf. And so when we come to pray, whether it be private or corporately, you come to think about it. Lord, we have a list. Oftentimes we're praying for the same things, uh, but we hope we don't pray in vain. We pray for the same things because we desire your hand to work in them. Lord, we don't just utter these words. We hope to see your hand of faithfulness in them that we may praise you all together corporately. And so we must realize that every act of prayer, if it moves the hand of God, uh, or at least submits itself to the work of God, then we must realize that every act of prayer from a sincere heart is under the direct influence of God's hand. He is the one that gives you the wisdom of what to seek for. It is Christ who gave us the role model prayer of what exactly we must frame our, our prayers like and for the glory of his name, of the Father's name. And so it is at each moment of prayer, how do we know it's for our good and how do we know his grace is upon it? Because it is at the moment of prayer where the man is able to draw from the very wells of his soul and able to express these things before the living God. He is compelled to draw from that deep place of his affections calling his own soul to holiness. He prays that God's name would be magnified in his life. There's no th thing that compares to it. No conversation that compares to it. Prayer with God, prayer to God, strives a man for holiness, makes a man holy, makes him consider his sin, makes him consider his need for God, makes him submit to the will of God. Prayer is such a grace. And when you're not praying, you're less submissive. You're unruly, really. And you'll notice that with your own lives, I hope you don't test it, but that's the truth. When you lack in prayer, you're less submissive, and that's the truth. And that's why Christ called us to daily pray. That we would hallow his name, and that his will would be done as it is in heaven, on here, uh, here in earth. Uh, and such a grace, because we are able to open our hearts to God, and it is even a means to mortify our sins. Have you ever been told that at the hour that your flesh is urged to commit such crime before God to pray that it, you may submit yourself? As Paul says, he submits his body, puts it under great discipline. I can imagine the apostle Paul praying many times. You see this example in 2 Corinthians 12. The moment he had the thorn of the flesh to be conceited, the Lord gave him the thorn of the flesh so that he would not boast of what he had seen. And he sought the Lord in prayer. Three times he sought God. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And so prayer is a means of grace. It is for your good because it helps you mortify the wickedness of your flesh. You realize his hand in all of these things. When your lusts are swelling, he deflates it all, relieves it by his power. And he dispels even all of your sorrows caused by, your dis by the distresses in this world. Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, who was distressed of her situation, desiring for a child. She was thought of as a crazy woman. Scripture says she prayed to the Lord. She poured out her soul. And Hannah said to the man she was speaking to, she poured out her great vexation. 
after the man talked with her, says that Hannah was no longer sad. That's often what prayer does. Because if we do it right, it changes the direction of our understanding. It changes the present state from, uh, from a mess to peace, from a complex matter to silence and tranquility. There is peace even in that prayer. And so there's no doubt that this means of grace is for our good when considering the wondrous effects that it brings to our soul. So yes, pray then, it's for you. We are the problem, we do not pray, but that is intended for your good. Now, aside from prayer, the means of grace also include every meeting of the saints. Do you realize that? As we get into a more, mod uh, more modern and modern, modern society, we come to realize that the meetings of the saints are not viewed as very important, not because of attendance sake or because the pastor is going to keep a record of who's coming and who's not, but God has ordained graces for his individual children. And you best believe it, that for your own soul, he has ordained grace for your good. It's like your mother preparing dinner at the table and serving it and you not wanting to eat. That's how we must view the grace of every meeting, the public means of grace. Where we are under the influence of God to bear one another in love. That is the only place, aside from the fellowship you have at home, where you're able to meet with like-minded people and not just hear a sermon but actually be sharpened, be edified by those who love you, those who direct you to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a great means of grace. That is definitely for our good, that we may bear one another. Paul says in Ephesians 4, with an e uh, inner eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit, where together we are keeping ourselves in line where we are able to address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Why we love the hymns? It's because they preach the word of God to us. When we sing, it's not just about tunes, being pianoless or with the piano or anything that might intrigue us or entertain us. The hymns are meant to preach to our soul. And while we're singing, we're also preaching it to our neighbor as they hear us sing. That's why it's very encouraging when you hear the saints singing. And that's not a shot at you to sing louder. <laughs> uh, but that is a part of our means of grace that uh, we encourage ourselves by doing that. And it does not just encourage you, but encourages the rest as well. Next, in Ephesians 5.19, is, is, is that, uh, sorry, that's where it's stated. Uh, but where we come together to express encouragement. Hebrews chapter 10 says, this is the only means of grace that God has given us that we may encourage one another as we see the day approaching near, as the Lord will return, how important it is. And this means of grace that is despised by, is despised by many, they will not see the Lord's return. He will come like a thief in the night and they would not know. They are like the virgins who were so careless. They did not want to come and arrive at the right time. They will be in shock as he comes and returns. And so when you come under the means of God's grace, do you realize that the, that the people assigned in Romans 12, each measure of grace given to each member of the body is meant for your good? For the pastor is called uh, to feed the flock of God, to take good care of them. Imagine, as, as we were talking with Dr. Alex Montoya, he said to us, someone would be, not in the right thinking, or they be out of their minds to want to take your position. Uh, because nobody wants to be problematic, and nobody wants to bear the weight uh, of many, and yet prepare a sermon, one or two or three, depending upon uh, how many means of grace publicly the church has. So no one wants that, but God has ordained men for that, and he's ordained them to be his instrument where he speaks to your soul, and not just the preacher, but each brother and sister. Whether it be the fellowships that we have here in our church, we have them bi-weekly, and they are a great means for your soul. Not only for you to be served, as many people say, well, what am I gonna get out of it? It's more than that, it's you are called to serve. And what is it that I may bring to my brother 
And what is it that I can bring to my sister? It surely is a means of grace. It definitely is for our good. And it compels us all uh, to encourage one another as we see the day drawing near. Apart from this is, uh, sorry, included with this is the prayer. Oh, uh, prayer meetings of the saints where the Lord compels us corporately to align ourselves up in the will of God, to lift up the corporate affections of the remnant. Isaiah 37, verse 4. There is a prayer needed for the remnant, and that's why it's important. To raise the prayer of faith, which saves the sick. James says, get, your ha uh, get, get yourself, uh, your ha uh, the hands of the elders laid on you. It's good it saves the sick, and it delivers the saints from all harms. Beloved, believe it or not, you may not know in all transparency what's going on in the lives of every believer in the local church, but you best need to know that you need to pray. The same was done in Acts 12.5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. If brethren who desperately need your prayers and without praying for their strength, who will then work for their good? We are the ones called for this. And so it is surely the means of grace then if it benefits the soul of our brother, our sister, and our very own. Our very own. And so the next time that the lying devil tempts you to avoid the means of grace, for whatever reason it may be, remind yourself of the intended and ultimate good that God ordained these things for you, for your soul. And so even the preacher Everyone might think, someone asked me, do you ever get tired? Sometimes I do. But beyond preaching to you, it is also a word for my soul. And believe it or not, many times when I preach that word, it's a great preaching to my own soul. I come to realize that God is absolutely talking to me. So we come because he has something ordained for my good. So lastly... As I send you home tonight, Christ's intercession, we read that in Romans 8, Christ's intercession works for our good. We consider him as our mediator, our intercessor. See, when the saint is weak and can barely pray for himself, Christ is praying for your good. Hebrews 7.25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He ensures our salvation. This is why this morning when we are reading from our confession of faith in, in that chapter, chapter 17 on the perseverance of the saints, yes, we will stumble, yes, we will fall, but it is the excellency of Christ that keeps us. Isn't that marvelous? Saved, secure, not because of works done in the flesh or done by ourselves, but because of His excellency. Uh, Dr. Yarborough came on up with us again, and he was with us for First Timothy, but now he's, he went through First, Second, Third John with us. And one of the questions that were asked is, who are these perpetrators in First John? Who are these people that we have to test the spirits, these antichrists? And Yarborough says, why are we so focused on perpetrators? Why are we so focused on the enemies of God and the Antichrist? Though that's mentioned there. But do you realize, he said, when he wrote the commentary to 1 John, the main word that's used there in 1 John is God. Second, love. And the third, son. He's saying 1 John is not about the perpetrators or the enemies or for us to be afraid of those who come, the apostates. It's 1 John to see the beauty and the excellency of Jesus Christ for his saints in a world full of those people. And so 1 John is never going to be the same again when I read it because absolutely the excellency of Christ for our souls. What comfort does this bring to us knowing that he intercedes for us to the end? His intercession for us never ends. You see, when he was on the earth, he demonstrated this when he told Peter before Peter denied him Many times, he said to him in Luke twenty two thirty one, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like weed. But I have prayed for you 
that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. This intercessory work of Christ impacted Peter in his heart in the direction where he was to go, not to fall away or to find himself in an eternal and ultimate backslidden state, but he is found to be restored because of Christ's prayer for him. And yet, even the revelation of God to Christ to reveal to Peter that this was not the way Peter was to go. And this is not just a prayer for the apostles, but certainly it's a prayer for all those who come to believe. And so as we close, John 17 is where we will um, look to understand this good prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 17, please. Verse 20. And how do we know that the intercession of Christ works for you? Pastor, he prayed for Peter. Well, what about me? Well, here it is. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through the word. Have you come to believe? Have you found rest in Christ and peace in him? Then his intercessory work is also for you. Now, what's involved in this intercession, this entire prayer in John 17? Well, it includes five things. Their security, their unity, their safety, their sanctity, and their destiny. Their security, their unity, their safety, their sanctity, and their destiny is all found in John 17. The first one being our security is found in verse 11. Read that. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I've I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. There's the second one there, that uh, the unity aspect, as I'm saying. So there's security, as he prays for the Father to keep us in his name. There is that... Uh, Unity, as he prays to the Father to keep us, as he and the Father are one. In verse 15, we also see safety. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You see, our safety from all things evil in this world. And so if Christ is praying, and we know for sure that there's no uh, flaw in his prayer, and there's no error in his prayer, um, I've come to realize even in Owen's writings that when we pray, there's a lot of things that we pray that are not good. But in Christ, all of his prayers are good. And if it's for his saints, you better believe it, that if his prayer to the Father is to keep you from the evil one, that's not to mean that you won't experience afflictions or sufferings in this world or that you won't sin, but ultimately is what he's speaking of, that you may be kept from eternal wrath and destruction and the fallenness of the world. And then your sanctity in verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Wash them continually in your word. Cleanse them and purify them. And lastly, your destiny in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. All of those five things. And Christ is interceding for that. You best believe it, that he's doing it even now. Your security, your unity, your safety, your sanctity, and your destiny is all included. Again, the bishop of the fourth century, Ambrose, said this. As a child that is willing to present his father with a small bunch of flowers, goes into the garden and there gathers some flowers and some weeds together. Think about that. I'm never going to ask my daughter to do this unless she picks something that I don't like. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to keep saying what I'm going to say. But the, a child who knows no better, if instructed by their father to take this, he'd probably take flowers and weeds and put them in a bunch and give it to his father. But Ambrose says, But coming to his mother, she picks out the weeds and binds the flowers. So the mother cleans it out and takes out the weeds and gives him a nice bundle of flowers. 
and so it is presented to the Father. Thus, when we have put up our prayers, Christ comes and picks away the weeds, the sin of our prayer, and presents nothing but flowers to his Father, which are a sweet-smelling savor. I don't know how many of my prayers are good, how many of them, many, must be many of them are bad, but Christ in his intercession for my good is fil- filtering even those things that the Father will not receive and bringing before him the things that are according to his Father's will that we would see our good in all of them. And so I pray with the examples I've mentioned, I would encourage you, these are some of those best things. But in Christ you have all things. Psalm 23, 1, I will not want, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. Yet I hope and pray that as you go home tonight preparing for the week, that the sovereignty of God provides certainty in all the best things for your good. And since it is all things and we only de- dealt with the best things so far, we will then next Lord's Day evening talk about the worst things. And yes, they are meant for your good as well. And so let us pray. Father, thank you for this comforting word. I pray that these words of life, again, resulted in the comfort of my hearers. It surely was for my soul. And I pray that they may see your sovereignty even demonstrated by everything, in the sense of your attributes working in every aspect of their life for their ultimate good, for every promise written in Scripture, applied to each individual, respecting that you are faithful to relieve us from the ways of this world. Lord, to the means of grace, from the private ones to the public ones, and most certainly the excellent prayer of Jesus Christ, his intercessory work is for our good. And when we do not know what's best for us, we know Christ is upholding us. He is keeping us secure. We are secure because you are for us. Then who can be against us? No, we are persuaded that all things will work out good for us and nothing will separate us from your love. So comfort my people, comfort my soul, and we pray that we would take it and use it and glory in your name because of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.